So tonight I'm going to talk to you about oysters, um, but I'm also going to spin in a little bit of our community science program, our beach monitoring program. Um, and I'm going to sort of start and end with Olympia oysters, but I'm going to talk about um, one of our other oysters that we, we have here in Puget Sound, um, a fair amount in the middle. So um, this is a talk that if you've been to a number of these, I think I gave a similar talk to this in 2016 or 2017, um, but I, I have added a fair amount. So if you were in the room for that one, um, don't fear, things have changed up a little bit. Um, and if you haven't um, heard a talk on this before, so hopefully you will find um, it somewhat enjoyable and, and hopefully pretty informative. And I gotta figure out how I'm gonna advance slides. Okay, so um, we actually only have one native oyster here in Puget Sound. Um, it's referred to as the Olympia oyster, or sometimes we just refer to it as an ole. Um, and um, it actually isn't just found here in Puget Sound, it's found from Southern California and actually even into Northern Baja, though there's some question about the boundary down there, all the way to Southeast Alaska, um, including along the both coasts of Vancouver Island. Um, many people will ask, like, have I ever eaten this or have I ever harvested this? And, um, and generally the answer is no. So they're, they're about up to three inches long, but a three inch um, ole is a big ole. Um, I've only seen a handful that size. You can see in this picture here, um, that is not an abnormally large thumb. So most of these things are just an, an inch or two in size. And if you know anything about the fishing regulations um, for oysters, you know that those are under the minimum size um, for harvesting oysters. And that is not an accident. It's actually to keep people from harvesting um, oles. However, um, you may have eaten oles. Um, and indeed, I ate oles last year at Harbor Wild Watch's um, donor dinner. Um, and um, and so they are produced by some of our local hatcheries. Um, and, and so you can find them um, in restaurants and things like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about reproductive biology today. And so I'm gonna explain a couple parts of that. Um, and, 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 and so some of it's gonna seem weird and, and some of it hopefully will, will help you understand what's going on later. Um, but these are the adults um, on this shell here. Um, this is actually a, a larvae that's been released into the water. Oles are what we refer to as um, alternating hermaphrodites. Um, and if you know the word hermaphrodite, you know that that means that they are both male and female across their lifespan. Um, interestingly enough, most species that are hermaphrodites either are both sexes at the same time or they switch from one to the other and then they never go back. Um, oles, on the other hand, actually alternate back and forth between acting as male and female. So for a while, they'll be a male and they'll, they'll produce sperm and for a while, they'll be female and they'll produce eggs. Um, and they release packets of sperm into the water um, and then other oysters actually suck that water in as they're feeding and they can recognize the difference between sperm and food. Um, and if it's food, they eat it. If it's sperm, it's, they don't. And if it's a female, they will actually fertilize their eggs with it. And then they brood those eggs inside the shell um, for up to about two weeks. Two weeks would be a long brooding, but um, somewhere in the 10 to 12 days is pretty much the norm. Um, and, and they'll brood upwards of two to 300,000 of these, these larvae at that point. Um, after two weeks, they're released into the water and they spend about two weeks floating around looking something like this, though it, um, it changes a little bit in structure and size across that time. And then they, they go through a process we refer to as settlement. Um, or sometimes we call it recruitment, where they attach to a substrate like this white shell here, which is actually a Pacific oyster shell, or a rock or a barnacle or something like that, where they start to grow up. 
they actually prefer to attach to um, things that are, are calcium based like shells. Okay. Um, so those are our native oysters. I do want to point out that we have a number of non-native oysters. Um, and, and so here's our ole. I should point out that this picture is not to scale. So some of these get much larger than ole's. Um, and, and what I've listed here are the species. So the Atlantic oyster or the Eastern oyster, sometimes called Virginica for Cross Austria, Virginica um, was actually introduced in the, the late 1800s. Um, and, and its introduction, here it is down here, um, was timed with the technology of the day, which was the railroad and the ability to ship these things in um, barrels from the East Coast to the West Coast and get them here before they die. Um, a little bit later, we introduced the Pacific oyster or the Japanese oyster, Crassostria gigas, um, and that is here. If you have seen oysters on our local beaches, undoubtedly it was a Pacific oyster. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about Pacific oysters. Um, in the 1920s, we introduced Kumamoto's, which if you've eaten oysters um, in an oyster bar or a restaurant, you likely have come across these. They're a relative of the Pacific oyster. Um, and then in the 1930s, there were some European oysters introduced, referred to as European flat often. Um, and this is actually a close relative of our, our native oyster. And if you look here, you can see it actually looks pretty similar to our Olympia oyster there. So we actually have um, as many as five different species of oysters growing here in Puget Sound, um, maybe even more than that in, in small um, batches but primarily it is Pacific oysters and Kumamoto's, which are the ones that are, that, that are grown and that you'll run into um, in restaurants. Um, I will point out that the Pacific oysters, when they were introduced in the early 1900s, it was to meet the, the need for more oysters for a burgeoning market, um, especially due to the decline in oles that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and they were introduced with the idea that they would never reproduce because our waters are too cold. Um, and that's important and we'll come back to that. We now know that that's actually not true um, and that they, they reproduce in a number of places around Puget Sound, but that was unintentional. Okay, so back to Oles. Um, so, um, Oles really started to be harvested um, in Washington in about the early 1850s. And, and this graph here is showing this rapid increase in the, um, the harvest from Willapa Bay, and then a really rapid decline. And then these open circles are the Puget Sound harvest. And what we see is a, a sort of rapid increase once the Willapa Bay population declined, and then again a decline after about 1900. Um, in the 1950s, um, this sort of historical term, a scant bushel, was sold for about $23, which would be more than $600 in, in today's, um, or about $10 per oyster um, in the shell. Um, so you can imagine really expensive, um, and, and lots of harvest. Um, initially in Willapa Bay, because those animals could be shipped to San Francisco, and I'll talk about why San Francisco in just a second, um, and, and they could do that via boats and they would still be alive. Um, it was a little bit longer to go from Puget Sound, and so um, sailing ships going from Puget Sound to San Francisco couldn't actually deliver live oysters, and it wasn't until the advent of both the railroad and steamships that we were able to transport live oles from Puget Sound to, um, to California. And if you know your California history at all, and you're eyeballing this 1850s-ish date, it's, it's actually really closely associated to 1849 um, and the gold rush. Um, and so this is just a really interesting his, historical note that the harvest of oles and the subsequent decline of oles 
is directly tied to um, the gold rush in California. Um, and one of the reasons is that um, if you struck it rich in the, the gold rush and you headed back into town, so you went into some place like Placerville and, um, and you went to have your first dinner after you struck it rich, um, the Kerry House Hotel in Placerville, um, you could order Hangtown Fry um, that came with Northwest oysters. And here is a sort of a modern view of what Hangtown Fry looks like. It's an oyster, an egg dish. Um, it would have been one of the most expensive and most ex extravagant dishes um, on the menu for those who had just sort of struck it rich. Um, and so that is that historical link to the gold rush that causes that, um, that, that spike in the fishery in the, in the Pacific Northwest. It did start initially, there are, if you were paying attention, um, Olympia oysters in, or native oysters in San Francisco Bay, um, but they were rapidly fished out and replaced by oysters from Washington. Um, probably the oysters from Washington were of a higher quality as well and favored for that reason. Okay, so there was this rapid decline in oysters um, and the decline was caused by overfishing, it was caused by habitat changes um, and also introduced species, other oyster species um, like Pacific oysters. And so since that time and since those declines, there have been a number of restoration efforts for Olympia oysters in Washington and actually all throughout the West Coast. I have colleagues that work in, in Southern California and they work on restore, restored ole beds as well in Southern California. Um, a couple examples. So this is, is from Glen Cove um, down on the Key Peninsula. If you've ever been to Camp Seymour, this is actually Camp Seymour in the, the background of this picture and their marine lab and their marine education section here in their dock. Um, and there is a small restoration area, which you notice are a bunch of shells. These are actually Pacific oyster shells with Olympia oysters growing on them. Um, here you can see those Olympia oysters growing on the larger Pacific oyster shells. Here's a Pacific oyster shell with a number of oles growing behind it. Um, done a little bit of survey work. We estimated um, at the, the peak of this, um, location, it was probably 10,000 animals, so a relatively small population of Olympia oysters. I know that that number sounds large, but when you remember that these animals are only a couple inches long, um, that's, that's not a huge number. Um, a larger scale example, and I'm going to use one from the North Sound. Um, there are plenty of these from the South Sound especially places like Liberty Bay, um, Dogfish Bay, um, more recently up near Port Gamble, a lot of work by Puget Sound Restoration Fund in that area on um, Ole's. Um, but this is a, a long-standing restoration that occurred up near Fidalgo Bay or in Fidalgo Bay near Anacortes. So you can see if you've been to Anacortes, going to the, the ferry to the San Juans, um, here's Highway 20 that you take. It sort of wraps around Fidalgo Bay. Um, there happened to be um, a couple of oil refineries on one side, some cows grazing next to it. And then there's this trestle that runs through the middle. And, and this trestle is what we see in the background of this picture. A lot of this work was spearheaded by this guy here by the name of Paul Donnell, um, but he also worked with Bill Taylor from Taylor Shellfish and Betsy Peabody from Puget Sound Restoration Fund. Um, and they basically did a couple things. They added a bunch of Pacific oyster shell to this area, and then they, um, they added a bunch of juvenile Olympia oysters um, to the area as well. And the restoration started off really slow. Um, it took a number of years before they saw any reproduction um, after adding um, Olympia oysters multiple times. Um, and then in the last few years, it's really taken off. And this bed now is estimated to have close to 5 million oles in it. So a really successful um, restoration project, which has been 
rel or is relatively large. Most of it occurs in this area of Fidalgo Bay, but now there's enough oysters and enough reproduction that they're starting to spread to other locations throughout the bay. Um, and so I use this as an example um, primarily because I've worked there. My colleague, Bonnie Becker from University of Washington, Tacoma, um, and um, a colleague from Puget Sound Restoration Fund um, had a, a research study there in, in 2013 that I'm gonna talk a little bit about. So um, these restoration sites can be really good study systems um, to understand the biology of these organisms. And so um, here's a map of um, Fidalgo Bay, not quite as pretty as the, the Google Earth picture. Um, and we had study sites all throughout, some that were in the, the subtitle, so these were actually buoys, others that were attached right to the bottom. Um, two adjacent to the, the trestle where the restoration site mainly was. And at each of these, we had what looks like not very technical science gear, and it's not. Um, we had these plastic tubes, they're actually mailing tubes, and they're filled with um, a high salt concentration chemical, and they, they sample larvae. Um, We've got this blue thing, which is actually dental chalk, and that helps us measure water flow. And then in the background, you can see it looks like a stack of shells. It's actually a stack of shells with a dowel through the middle. Um, and this allows us to collect juvenile oysters. And there's a lot of data um, around this. It just came out in a paper this year um, that, that we wrote, and, and I'm not gonna go into all of the details here, um, but I do want to point out that we learned a lot about how these oyster larvae move around. And here in this graph, what you see are um, data from the South Trestle, the North Trestle, the East Intertidal, and the West Intertidal. Um, and these, the black and the gray bars are, um, are larvae of different size classes. The black ones are small, the, the gray ones are large, and then the settlers are the white bars, and those settlers are juveniles that have attached to these, what we call shell strings. You'll hear more about those shell strings later on. Um, and what we found was that the, the larvae don't actually go very far. Um, they are primarily staying and coming back to um, very near those adults. And, and we think it's a little bit of, they don't actually move very far, but we also have a, a hunch that they are attracted to the presence of the adults. And so we can learn a lot about um, the biology of these species by studying some of these restoration sites. Okay. So now I wanna jump in and talk a little bit about our, um, our beach monitoring program. So a community science program run by Harbor Wild Watch um, in conjunction with me um, at Pacific Lutheran University. We started this program in 2013. Um, and, and basically it's got a couple goals. Um, the, I would say the, the primary one um, is to develop a baseline understanding um, or at least the baseline data of the patterns of diversity, what species are there and their abundance on our local beaches. And these happen to be um, generally rocky, sandy beaches. Um, and I'll show you a map of where these are. Um, and related to that, a way to study or at least document um, local changes or maybe even regional changes because there are other groups that have similar methodologies that they're using throughout Puget Sound um, and into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And then um, sort of the, the last goal though, I would argue probably maybe as important is to engage and educate um, the public. And this goes right back to Harbor Wild Watch's mission. Um, and as you can see from this picture here, we've got a bunch of volunteers. These happen to be um, from our Sea Stars and Sun Stars and Junior Naturalist program. Um, that are all working together to count animals in this quadrant. Um, hopefully, I won't bore you too much with the details, but I do want to give you some details of what we do um, before we talk about what we, 
fine. Um, so we have sampling locations sort of from, from Gig Harbor South into Carn Inlet. So we, um, our initial sampling locations were um, the Tacoma Narrows, um, the Demolay or Fox Island Sandspit, Copachuck State Park, Purdy, Maple Hollow, which is a key Penn Park, and Penrose State Park. Um, and more recently, we've added sites at the mouth of Gig Harbor um, and at Sunrise Beach. Um, and we chose these primarily um, for um, access. And so that's why we work at a lot of parks, is that um, we, we can access tidelands that can be privately held in the state. Um, also, that they have similar habitat. So if we can see on this beach, we tend to have rocky upper beaches and then sandy, muddy lower beaches. This happens to be the, the base of the Fox Island Sandspit, the Demolay property, which is a Penn Met park. Um, and I should thank Penn Met, um, Key Penn, and the state parks for giving us access to um, all of these sites. They've been really good. Um, what you'll also notice about many of these sites is that they are places that previously um, we led beach walks or had some other experience with them. And so um, it was a way to link up our existing programs um, with the, this new um, community um, science program that, that started in, in 2013. So it's not that new, but it, it was new at the time. Um, so I just want to give you a really quick run through of what we do. It's actually um, a protocol that we have, have borrowed from Island County and Washington um, State University's Beach Watchers program. Um, and we've modified it to be used in the South Sound, um, which has changed a number of things. Um, so along this vertical transect from basically the top of the beach down to really the, the minus one foot tidal height. Um, we look at the presence and absence of different animals. So two and a half meters each side of this. Um, and length varies based on the beach. We also measure the elevation change across the beach to see if there are changes in either um, sediment supply coming from the top of the beach or deposition of sand or gravel coming from the marine side. And then, um, at four tidal heights, I know this only shows three because the, the beach watchers only actually do three. Um, we have, have transects, so with the plus five, plus one, zero, and minus one foot tidal heights, um, we do these, these transects with quadrats, so we're basically counting things within those PVC pipe squares that are a half meter on a side. Um, and we're either counting things or we are um, looking at the percent of the area that's covered by that species. Um, to sort of explain our thinking around this, um, the, the Island County Beach Watchers do the plus one, the zero, and the minus one. Um, and that makes sense in that area because their tidal range is not as extreme. Um, Kitsap County actually does the, um, the plus five and the zero, and they actually do the plus 10, which actually is, is the terrestrial environment. We weren't interested in the terrestrial side, so we chose um, two levels to overlap with them. And that allows us to compare our data, um, both with what's going on in Kitsap County, but also what's going on um, up in the Central and North Sound, as well as the Strait of Juan Pico. Um, we do this both day and night. So in the summers, um, our low tides, or our good low tides are in the, the, the mornings and into early afternoons. Um, during the winter, however, our best low tides are at night. And so um, this happens to be a nice clear night out at Narrows Beach. You can see the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the background. Um, and, and so we work when the low tides are, um, and there are volunteer opportunities both in, in summer as well as winter, though we are dealing a little bit right now with the pandemic. And, and being in phase two, we're not allowed to have large groups. And so we're limiting the size um, to some experienced volunteers right now, but hopefully we'll be back and, and going, um, maybe in winter, but, but hopefully um, next summer for sure. Um, so 
In addition to that sampling protocol, we, in the summers, we use what's called a beach seine, so a long net, and we use that to look for fish. So we drag it through the water, um, and then we pick out fish that are in it. We identify those fish and, um, and count them. This is often a time that we interact with the public because people are like, what are you doing with the big net? And, um, and then they get to see these really cool fish that are coming up um, in these nets. We also um, partner with University of Santa Cruz and Western Washington, or UC, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and Western Washington University um, doing sea star surveys. These initially started out as sea star wastings um, monitoring surveys, and now are being used both to monitor sea star disease, um, but also the recovery of, of some of our species. And then I'm going to talk a lot more about this, but we've started to add in um, some work looking at, um, at measuring sizes of oysters on many of our beaches. And here's Stina um, measuring some, some Pacific oysters. So we've added on some things to the, the Beach Watchers protocol that, that fit things that we want to do, um, both from sort of my research priorities around oyster size, um, but also um, helping to support um, science efforts um, regionally. And these sea star surveys go on from um, Baja into Alaska. So we contribute um, a big chunk of the data from the South Puget Sound. Um, so what are some of the species we look at? We're really, at least in the quadrats, looking at everything that are there. So, um, but, but even in the presence absence surveys, we're just not counting, but we're looking at chitons, like this woody chiton here, or barnacles. Um, here's a flatworm on someone's finger, um, mussels and Olympia oysters, um, crabs, sand dollars, sometimes baby sand dollars like this one. Um, and then into the fish, these happen to be some newly settled. They look a little bit like eels, but they're actually gunnels. Um, and, and so we sometimes get big fish, but sometimes we get small fish. Um, and and we're, we're really looking for everything that's out there. So now I want to pivot a little bit and, and talk about a theme that I really like to talk about, and that's the role of serendipity in science. Um, and, and we like to think of science as being sort of this hypothesis-driven endeavor. Like, we want to test, does a, a vaccine work to protect people from COVID-19? And, and our hypothesis is that it, it does, and then we test to see, does it do that? Um, and much of science operates that way, but a lot of it doesn't. Um, and, and this is a good example. So we're out on these beaches um, looking to see um, what's there, and we can never predict it until we get out there. Um, and so I want to tell a little story about two oysters. Um, and if you look at these two pictures, um, you can see that these oysters over here look a little bit different than these oysters over here. These are sort of striped. Um, they've got these weird ridges on them and things like that. Um, sorry, I'm going to close a window. Um, so um, they are indeed different species. Um, and um, if we, we look at some other pictures, what we see are Olympia oysters here. Um, in this picture, there's, this one's pretty obvious. It's not so obvious that there's one down here as well on that. And these are from our sampling. You can see that um, the PVC pipe quadrat. So um, these are things we picked up in our, our surveys. And then in 2015, these really, what we called weird looking olies showed up. Um, and, or what I think now we sort of think more of as initially the mystery oysters that were these weird striped ones. And you can see they've got these, these very obvious growth bands associated with them. Um, and, and we started seeing them at really small sizes. Um, and I, I shared some pictures around. And indeed, what we found out was that these were Pacific oysters. And that while they were never intended to reproduce, um, there are places where they do. If you've ever been to Belfair State Park, you, you probably have seen the large oyster reefs, and those are Pacific oysters. And 
Um, they do relatively well in Belfair. One of the reasons is the water temperature gets pretty warm there, which you would also know if you've ever swam on those beaches. So um, we started paying attention to initially to these, these mystery oysters. Um, and, um, and so what we have here, I do have some data graphs. So um, if you're not sciencey, listen to the words. If you, you want to pay attention to the, the graphs, that's fine too. Um, but what we have is our, our data starting from summer 2013, our first year through summer 2020. Um, so this year, and, um, and we have this data for um, C. gigas, is Crestostrea gigas, that's the Pacific oyster, that's these guys. Um, and the open circles are Austria lurida, or the, the olies. And I want you to notice a couple of things. One, olies have never been super common at our sites. Um, but in some cases, they, they were around, especially at Maple Hollow and Penrose and Purdy, um, but, but really not at De Malay, not really where we look at Copachuk. These were pretty much oyster-free locations. Um, and then in 2015, we had this rapid spike in, um, in Pacific oysters. Um, and that happened at De Malay and, and Copachuk. Um, a little, we saw a little blip in, um, in Purdy. It wasn't until later that we started seeing them at Maple Hollow and, and Penrose. Um, and we saw a really characteristic pattern that I'll talk a little bit more about um, later on, but um, we see this, this increase in abundance, um, and these are all juveniles, they're all really small, and then as they start to die off, um, or some die off, some are just getting bigger, they, they decline in, in numbers. And we see that with, with most of these sites. Um, I also wanna point out that um, when these increases in, um, in Pacific oysters occur, we actually get some declines in our, our native oysters. Um, we're not exactly sure that these are direct re directly related. They might be indirectly related, um, and I'll talk about how that indirect relationship works um, in a few minutes. Um, and one of the nice things about being on these beaches through our community monitoring program um, is that we were out there already collecting data at these known transects. Um, this is a graph showing Copachuk, um, which is, has some of our best oyster data. Uh, it had the highest numbers of, um, of Pacific oysters when they, they came in, and so we often look at this one. And what we see is that they were really common at the, the higher tidal heights and actually fairly rare at the low tidal heights. One of the reasons for this is these are most, this is mostly sand down here and oysters don't do well on sand. Our native oysters um, were there, they just weren't very common. Interestingly enough, at places like Fidalgo Bay, um, generally we think of good oyster habitat as being down at this tidal height, but because there's no rock um, or hard substrate, they live up higher, which means that they might end up competing for space, and that might be part of the reason why we've seen a decline in olies uh, with Pacific oysters coming. So on top of looking at um, oyster density, um, and, and this is just for Pacific oysters, um, these Plots with the, the circles are the same graphs you just saw before, but just for the, the Pacific oysters. And what we see is this, this peak and then this decline. Um, the other graphs are, um, are median size, so a measure of the average size of oysters. And I want to point out two patterns here. Um, and I'm going to start actually with Penrose, because Penrose is a nice example of is an increase in the oyster numbers and then a decline, and they're not nearly as abundant, but what we see is that um, the average size just keeps increasing and then it sort of plateaus out as they get as big as they're probably gonna get. And this is what we would expect in a situation where we had those oysters come in over maybe a year or two and then very few more Pacific oysters come in and we just have an aging population. 
That's slightly different from Kopachuk, where we had an increase in oysters, and then this decline, just like we saw at Penrose, but then a little blip up. And that blip up was driven by um, more reproduction. Um, and, and so not just a single event where those larvae came in, but multiple events. We can also see that in our size. We see an increase in, in size um, up until a point, and then the size drops. And the size drops not because the animals shrink, they can't do that, but rather um, that we have a lot of small individuals coming into our population, and then it starts to grow um, and get larger, uh, or the average size gets larger across time. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Kopachuk um, for a second and, and point out sort of what this, what this looks like and what we can learn from. So one of the important questions um, that we, we asked early on was, was this a one-time um, example of these larvae um, surviving after reproduction um, and then becoming part of the population? Or were we seeing multiple years of reproduction where those um, Pacific oysters might start to establish? One of our most powerful tools to do that is actually looking at the distribution of sizes. So here what we have are data from Kopachuk again. Um, and this shows the maximum dimension of the shell um, and, and what all the individuals we sampled look like. We try and measure approximately 100 animals every time we go out um, to give us a nice sample size. And if you're tracking the times, um, this figure has gotten unwieldy, and so I had to go to two columns. But we start here in summer 2016 when we started measuring size, and time goes on through summer 2018, and then it loops down here and into summer 2020. And we just sampled this last week. Um, and what we see is early on, so summer of 2016, they were relatively small. And every time we went out, they got a little bit bigger. So the peak in this graph starts to shift to the right. But what I also want you to pay attention to are these other little sub peaks or these smaller peaks. This would indicate a second bout of reproduction. So it, this is, these are new um, individuals coming into our population that were probably spawned at the end of summer 2016. They were too small for us to really see well in winter, and now they're big enough um, to see. They're under an inch, but, um, but still big enough to see with the naked eye um, that we could start seeing them. And what we see is at Kopachuk, we actually get multiple years of reproduction. Um, so we see reproduction that's happening um, multiple times, and then it actually shuts down a little bit, and those individuals start to age. We get that sort of old group and the young group, and they age. And then we see every once in a while, another little individual or two sneak into our population, um, showing us that there's still a little bit of, of, of reproduction going on and continuing to supply this population with young individuals. Um, this is important because what we wanna know is, is this non-native oyster species continuing to reproduce and is it likely to um, become and, and be maintained a dominant feature on these beaches? Um, graphs are great, but I think pictures are even better. Um, so what does this actually look like? Um, here we take photographs of all of our quadrats, um, and, and that allows us to go in and, and actually look at how some of these changes are occurring. These pictures don't look that different. They're very close to one another. They're probably within a meter of one another, but they're at two different times. This one down here is at um, in summer 2016 when our animals are relatively small. And I've circled all of the oysters in this quadrat in red circles, estimating of their approximate size. If we go into summer of 2018, we can see that there's, there's more oysters and they've gotten a lot bigger. So a lot more of the bottom is covered in oyster 
and that has implications to the larger community of animals. So I like these pictures because they indicate not only an increase in the number of oysters, but also the size of the oysters. And if you go out to Kopachuk even today and walk along the beach, which you see are a lot of really big oysters on that beach, they're all Pacific oysters. Um, and they're the ones that grew up from these early reproductive events. Um, so what this does, or what these data do, is they help us um, sort of understand a little bit better what's going on. And we now know that um, the temperature plays a big role in the survival of, um, of these oysters. Um, and I just wanna point out really quickly here is, is temperature data from Cart Inlet, that, that area from 2015, 2016. I didn't add on, but um, we could have, but it stayed relatively cold, though it warmed up in 2019 into 2020 with a little bit of a resurgence of the blob. If you remember the blob and the El Nino of 2016, we now refer to that as the, um, the marine heat wave of that time period. And we know from other areas that when temperatures get close to 17 degrees Celsius, Pacific oysters start to survive and uh, their larval development and settle as juveniles. And we can see that those two years got warm enough to do that, but the years around them um, didn't, and that matches things relatively well. Um, here, this is data from, um, from um, the Hood Canal, a study not by, by me, but Jen Rusink and one of her graduate students. Um, and from UW, what they found is as the temperature increases, the number of, um, of, of those newly settled larvae increases um, for Pacific oysters. And what they found there was that good years for things like Pacific oysters happen to be bad years for native oysters, and good years for native oysters happen to be um, bad years for Pacific oysters. And you notice that it's 2015 Hood Canal, a little bit different thing going on during that time. Um, but this is one of the other reasons we're concerned moving forward about native oysters is that um, as water temperatures rise with climate change, we're likely to see more and more um, Pacific oysters and fewer and fewer um, native oysters or olies. And, and that can sort of hamper our ability to um, reestablish those populations. Um, and if we go back to Puget Sound oyster restoration, most of the oyster restoration that, that occurs um, is for, um, for olies. Um, and it, it, it actually is, <laughs> occurs in a, a pretty interesting way. So they use um, Pacific oyster shell as habitat for the native oysters. So this is Puget Sound Restoration Fund. They'll bring in a whole barge of shell and then they'll blast it off pretty much with a fire hose into the area they want. So here's an area that has had shell put down in it. And then that group often relies on natural reproduction of, of native oysters to establish populations, which they then model. Some groups will also put out um, native oysters um, to serve as brood stock to produce larvae. Um, and there are a number of sites all throughout um, the Puget Sound, which are priority sites for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife um, for these sorts of restoration areas. Um, this work here is, is shown from sort of Dyes and Sinclair Inlet um, and Liberty Bay, but Puget Sound Restoration Fund just had a major project up in Port Gamble as, as well. Um, there are no priority sites here in Carr Inlet, but there are historic populations which Washington Department um, of Fish and Wildlife would actually love to see uh, um, restored as well. And that leads us to our next the sort of final thing I want to talk about. Um, so I am working with Harbor Wild Watch, um, University of Washington Tacoma, um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Pierce County, I'm forgetting some folks, um, Coastal Conservation Association, and we are starting the early work to look at a sort of trial restoration of olies at, at Penrose State Park. Right now we're in the pre-restoration time period, 
And um, basically what we are doing is we are collecting baseline data from um, Penrose as well as Maple Hollow um, as our, our sort of control site. Um, so an area that won't have a restoration at it. Um, you'll notice both of these are um, part of our beach monitoring program. That is not an accident. It's actually on purpose so that we can leverage the data we already have for um, a lot of before data, um, before a restoration, and then we'll continue to collect data after. Um, and then we'll be looking both at a control, Maple Hollow, and an impact or that restoration site um, of Penrose. And, um, and we do the algae and invertebrate surveys through the beach monitoring program and the beach saning through that program as well, though do a little bit more beach saning um, at those sites just to document some of the changes. Um, and we do some shoreline mapping to understand the types of like, habitat that are there um, and how those might change. And then we also have been monitoring oyster recruitment um, since last year. Um, I will say that we saw no native oyster recruitment at Penrose or Maple Hollow last year. We saw just a few Pacific oysters um, and so the hope is that if we are able to restore this site, um, that we will start to see some recruitment or, or that reproduction of, of olies into those, into at least Penrose um, and, and, and establish communities outside of just the restoration area. Um, so the future work and this future work has sort of turned into the present work now. Um, so we are controlling or continuing those sort of before after control impact studies and we're, we're, we're sort of finishing out the before and getting into the after. Um, either this summer or early in fall, we hope to do some pilot studies, um, putting out um, shell as habitat, but also um, a few thousand olies um, we want to do five um, 10 by 10 foot plots um, of shell and each plot will have about a thousand to two thousand olies on it um, but they're going to be really small they're going to be about a quarter inch in length and so that doesn't make up a lot of them and a lot of them won't survive um, additionally we have a project that's a companion project with washington department of health to look at um, the effects of climate change on cyanobacteria and also how that relates to um, shellfish restoration. Um, and I just want to point out again that, that list of folks. Um, so we work, this project is a, a big partnership now with Pierce County Surface Water Management, um, University of Washington Tacoma, this is Bonnie Becker's lab, Pacific Lutheran University and my lab. Um, and when I say our lab, really what I mean are our students. Um, Harbor Wild Watch, Coastal Conservation Association, which has actually provided a lot of the funding um, for students. And there are a bunch of other groups also that are being spun into this work as well. Um, so that is what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. I hope you learned something about both Olympia oysters um, and, and Pacific oysters, but also the work that we do um, with Harbor Wild Watch um, to support some of these projects. Um, and hopefully I've left enough time that we can have some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen, though I may bring it back up if we need it. And I'll pop back in here as well. Uh, awesome, thank you so much, Mike. We have questions rolling in and um, I encourage folks who are watching the comments over on Facebook. If you're watching it in real time, please feel free to fire off some questions that you might have for Mike. If you're watching it not in real time up on YouTube, um, you can always email us with any questions you might have at info at harborwildwatch.org. Um, our first question that we have is from Stina. She's very curious to know what oyster species Mike thinks is the most tasty. And Stina's a science <laughs> specialist for, for reference. I have to admit, um, I was super excited at our last um, fundraiser dinner for Harbor Wild Watch to get to eat olies for the first time. And they have become my favorite and I don't eat them very often. Um, so if I'm not eating olies, um, 
they go by a lot of different names, um, but I do really like the Kumamoto's. If you like oysters, what you, you learn is that every place they're from and the species all have a slightly different taste. Um, I actually like the briny ones um, and, and some people don't. And so I, um, so I have to say that Oli's are my current favorite and I try not to eat them very much. Um, though I will say that the Oli's that you get in restaurants are produced solely for that purpose by Taylor Shellfish um, and that Taylor is actually really good at producing um, oysters for conservation and restoration as well. That's where we're gonna get our oysters as well as other groups like Puget Sound Restoration Fund um, produce Oli's purely for conservation. But don't feel bad if you see them in a restaurant, they were produced just for that purpose, um, not for um, conservation. Do Oli's have a more briny taste or like wh which one has that more briny taste that you prefer? Is that the Kumos? Yeah, I mean, the Oli's can be pretty briny. It sort of depends on where they come from as well. Um, I tend to like things with a little bit of an earthy taste to them as well. Um, and, and so I, I was intrigued by them. They, I don't know how to describe the taste, but I, I remember thinking to myself that I'm glad they don't get to be over three inches because I would probably want to harvest them. <laughs> I guess it's all in preference. I did start a poll partway through your presentation too in the comments to see if people prefer to eat oysters or just admire them on the beach. And it kind of seems to be split a little bit. The Harbor Wild Watch team was chiming in. Uh, definitely an acquired taste sometimes. <laughs> I um, did not like them until a couple of years ago. Really? Yeah. What changed your I mind? I them as a child and, and didn't like them. Um, I think partially because I was eating really big ones, big Pacific oysters from California, um, often partially cooked on a barbecue. and. It was not a good situation. I liked the smaller ones much better. Huh. Really is all about preference. <laughs> um, Liz asked a couple of questions. Her first one was a little bit more of an observation. So she said in 2015, that's when she really started seeing the big oyster shells with uh, purple stripes that you had mentioned and sometimes pink stripes. And she asked, are those, so those are Pacific oyster shells then if she was absolutely um, and that's a great observation I've been um, running into people all over the place um, who have made the same observation um, and and it's great I'm so happy that people are actually noticing these things um, and I encourage you if you make those sorts of weird observations to reach out to me, reach out to Harbor Wild Watch, like let us know. Um, and I didn't get into it, but one of the great things about community science is that there's just not enough scientists to do the work that we need to do or see the things we need to see. And so um, the general public is pretty good at figuring out if something's new or different. And so if it is, let somebody know. Um, even if it seems silly, I'll tell you if it's, something that's super commonplace that you just happen to see for the first time. But I might also get super excited and want to come visit your beach. <laughs> this is true. Feel free to fire off anything uh, that you might see or observe that's different on your beach, local beaches, a beach from afar to us. We can always search out resources um, to get in contact with an appropriate party, or we can ask Mike to help us ID things. I had an instance where I found a whole bunch of sea cucumbers on my local beach, California sea cucumbers strewn all over the place. Mike was my go-to. I went, is this normal? What's happening? So observations can certainly come in all different sizes and uh, I love the curiosity. I'm with you on that. Um, Liz's second question for you was along kind of the lines of community science and if there's a way for residents to reestablish Oli's on their own beaches and if so, would doing this even be helpful or advisable to do? Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a complicated answer. And I'm gonna, I'll start with the easy part. And the easy part is, yes, you can do this. Um, just like you can put Pacific oysters or um, clams on your beaches, or you can put mussels on your beaches. Um, 
because you can own tidal lands in this state, that is totally appropriate. Um, and you can actually order oysters um, from Taylor Shellfish is probably the easiest place to get them. Um, you will find that olies are pretty hard to get, but um, if you put in an order well ahead of time, um, you can probably go ahead and, and order them. I would always encourage you to put olies on the beaches rather than Pacific oysters, as Pacific oysters are a non-native species. Um, and, and the old argument would have been, well, the Pacific oysters aren't gonna reproduce, so it doesn't matter, but now we know that they indeed they might be reproducing, and so that is, is a little bit problematic. Um, the only thing I would ask, um, and, and this is a question to ask whoever you're sourcing your, um, your bivalves from, or your clams or oysters, um, is where did the brood stock come from? So um, what we know is that certain areas start to um, develop different genetics, and it is always better to um, put out animals that come from a similar area that you're, you're putting them. So um, that's, the, that's the, the most defensible answer. The other answer is that um, related to that, um, if you're in an area where there just aren't very many olies, I would argue that it's probably better to have olies than not have olies. And natural selection will figure the genetics out. Um, if they're not really good at reproducing and surviving in your area, they just won't. Um, and if they are good at it, then, then they will. And so um, I just had a conversation with someone from the state parks about this and about our outplanting of oysters. They wanted to know where they're coming from. And it's a great question and I'm glad they asked it. Um, and, and so it's something that I think you should think about, but I would absolutely encourage you to do it. And I've, I've talked to multiple um, local landowners um, or beach owners who have done um, just that. Awesome. We have a whole bunch of other questions rolling in too. So I'm just, I'm going to go down the list. Um, okay. Joe wants to know if there are any invasive threats to the local oyster populations. Um, so the biggest invasive, th or, and let me talk about that term for just a second. So w when we talk about invasive species or non-native species, they're species that come from somewhere else. We call them invasive because we have judged them to be bad or harmful based on our human values. So what someone, one person might think of it in, as an invasive, someone else may not. And so um, some people get concerned when I talk about Pacific oysters as an invasive species because it's a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide, um, but they compete with our native species. Um, so are they non-native or are they invasive? It depends on who you ask. Um, so do they compete with our local oysters? Yes. Um, are there other species that have been introduced with them? Things like oyster drills, which are a type of snail that can drill through the shell, much like a, a moon snail drills through the shells of some of our local clams. Those have been introduced as well and are a threat both to um, non-native as well as, um, as native species um, of oysters. Uh, I tend to use the term non-native versus native because I'm trying not to introduce a value judgment. And some, I was approached once at a conference by someone who claimed I hated Pacific oysters. Um, and I had to explain to them that I don't hate Pacific oysters. I actually love Pacific oysters. Um, but I recognize that they're not a native species. There's a difference there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John wants to know if there was an oyster industry on the Purdy Spit. He's observed big stacks of shells there. Yeah. So. Um, if you're you're driving um, sort of, I guess that would be west, you'll notice those big piles on the, the inlet side. Um, and, and yeah, so they're um, historically, while there's mostly hard shell clam culture that goes on um, 
in in Burley Lagoon right now. There is also some oyster, and historically there were lots of oysters um, in there. Um, it's actually a place now that has its own what we would call naturalized population of oysters. So if you um, walk down by the the pretty bridge behind Local Boys, um, you can find um, Pacific oysters that have 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 naturally um, set into those areas. Um, and so yes, there there was historically um, culture there, and there still is a little bit of culture, is my understanding, in those as well, and and in lots of areas. So Minter Creek and the Minter Brook Oyster Company as well. Eric has two questions. He says, hi, Mike, got on late, but two questions. One, it seems like last year or two, there was a tremendous bloom of oysters on our beach on outside of Horsehead Bay. Any reason for that? Um, so on the outside of Horsehead Bay, um, so my guess is most of those are Pacific oysters. Um, and, and one of two things happened, either they got big enough for you to see from the reproductive events of like 2015 and 2016, or they are actual animals that, that's, um, that were spawned in like 2019 or 2018. Um, and in 2019, we did see a reestablishment of the blob, um, and we have seen a little bit of reproduction around that but not a, nearly as much as what we saw in, in 2015 and 2016. So my guess is what you're seeing are animals that got big enough um, that you, you really started to notice them um, from that earlier reproductive event. And then Eric's second question, um, I'll, I'll see if you understand it, I might, I'll, I'll just, he asked, <laughs> what is the background reasoning on the R month story? Do you know what he's referring to? Um, no, can you post the question into the, the group <laughs> chat so I can actually yeah. see the verbiage? Yeah, yeah, Eric, if, uh, if you're hearing this and wouldn't mind clarifying as well, uh, that would be wonderful. Oh. Oh, never mind. Um, I out. Okay. Um, so um, this has to do with sort of when you can harvest um, shellfish and... Um, oh, the and R. So, yeah. Yes. So whether or not those months have an R, and a lot of that has to do with summer months. Um, and we know as water temperatures rise in the summer, um, that all sorts of things start to bloom, like phytoplankton, and some of those can create um, issues for the health of those shellfish. And so that's sort of the, the reasoning is it's looking at, at seasonal shifts in, in things that can cause illness. Um, and it just happens to be that um, basically May, June, July, August is, um, is the summer and those tend to be sort of getting into our time where the water temperature warms up, but we also have more daylight. Um, and so we see an increase in the, um, the phytoplankton, um, some of which can cause paralytic shellfish poisoning, um, amnesic shellfish poisoning, all sorts of things. Also Vibrio um, outbreaks, which are an issue with butterflies. All not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got one more from uh, Sarah. She said, you said you don't like to eat Pacific oysters, which are too big. What is too big for you in terms of size? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that I don't like to eat them. Um, I, but I do think there's an, opt an optimal size depending upon how you're eating them. And so this is the more nuanced side of things. Um, if you're going to make an oyster sandwich and you're going to bread and Fry that thing, it can be as big as you want. Um, so, Who says that? <laughs> um, and so if you've ever been to someplace like Dos Wallops um, and, and, and been to the Gooey Duck, which is the home they claim of the world famous oyster sandwich um, or fried oyster sandwich, like 
they can be a, as big as you want as long as you bread and fry it in my mind and put it on bread. Um, if I'm eating it on the half shell, I don't want to have to chew it necessarily to get it all down. I'd like to be able to get it down in, in one swallow. Um, I do chew it because I like the taste of it, but I don't want to have to like chew multiple parts to be able to swallow the oyster at one time. <laughs> so that is the way too detailed answer to your question. So a couple inches. I mean, I just think they're harder to shuck when they're bigger, right? Yeah. The smaller ones are you just, you're actually able to shuck. But if it's four inches long and you want to bread and fry that thing, I'd happily eat it. <laughs> there you go. Now we know about Mike's oyster eating habits. Yes. Thanks for asking, Eric <laughs> and Sarah. That's Sarah and uh, Eric. Um, I think that's it. I, I think that's just about all the questions rolling in you're getting a lot of thank yous uh, and giggles in the comments as well <laughs> we had uh we had quite a handful of people tuning in shout out to our beach monitors uh from both winter and summer who tune in and for those of you who might be interested in learning more about this research or perhaps getting involved with harbor wild watches community science program probably in the winter time due to the pandemic, you can reach out to us or visit our website and we'll connect you with all the details. Again, if you're enjoying these videos and enjoying our content, you can like our page on Facebook or Instagram, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, hit the notification bell and you'll get alerted every time there's a new video up. Otherwise, I think that's it for us. Again, if you have any other burning oyster questions, you can feel free to email us to them and we'll fire them off to Mike. Uh, and he'll he'll get them answered. Otherwise, thanks so much, Mike. This was really Thank fun. You. I appreciate your time. <laughs> we'll thanks everyone for great questions and for hanging out. Woohoo! Cool. <laughs> <laughs>